We have always heard about billionaires who dropped out of college to launch companies and hit it big. Everyone from Bill Gates and Mark Zuckerberg to Steve Jobs and Michael Dell. In fact, the billionaires list is disproportionately made up of college dropouts. But while these are insane success stories, the one similarity between all these stories is that they happen in western countries and more specifically, America. Not only does this make the journey itself easier given that there's more opportunity, but more importantly, the consequences of failing are actually not that bad. Worst case scenario, you can just flip burgers at McDonald's and live paycheck to paycheck. In many Asian countries however, if you don't make it with your business and you don't have a degree, you could very well end up homeless given the extreme competition even for entry level jobs. Despite this, an Indian man named Gautam Adani was not only willing to drop out of college, but also willing to drop out of high school to chase his dreams. And just last week, Gautam surpassed Mukesh Ambani to become Asia's richest person. So here's how a high school dropout became Asia's richest man. Taking a look back, Gautam was born on June 24, 1962 in Ahmedabad, India. His father was a local textile merchant which should have provided Gautam with a decent upbringing financially. But the problem was that Gautam had 7 siblings, so his father's average income didn't stretch that far. While his family wasn't particularly rich, his father's small business likely swayed the core values of the family. Generally, in India, college is thought of as the holy grail. And people who don't follow the traditional path are strongly stigmatized within society. But it looks like Gautam's father's business made the family more open to alternative paths. And this was quite important given that Gautam hated school from the very beginning. He had very little interest in academics and he didn't feel that school could get him to where he wanted to be anyway. So at age 16, he dropped out of high school and moved to Mumbai to give business a shot. He only had a few hundred rupees in his pocket or less than a hundred dollars. It's not clear what exactly he tried to do in Mumbai, but it seems like it was a big failure as Gautam would return home and enroll in Gujarat University which is known for having extremely generous admissions. They don't post a formal acceptance rate, so it's thought that anybody who applies and meets the base criteria is accepted. In other words, Gautam basically enrolled in a community college. This didn't matter much though as Gautam would drop out of here as well just two years later at age 18. He traveled to Mumbai once again with a few hundred more rupees, but this time he had a plan. Gautam went ahead and scored an entry level job as a diamond sorter at an exporting company called Mahindra Brothers, not to be confused with Mahindra Motors. While this job didn't pay much, it gave Gautam insight into the diamond business and he would use this knowledge to start up a diamond flipping business. This turned out to be quite successful and made Gautam a good amount of money. It's not like he could just retire, but he no longer had to worry about making ends meet. In the meantime, one of his brothers who was also inclined towards business started up a small plastics factory and asked Gautam to come join him. Given that Gautam didn't want to flip diamonds for the rest of his life, he took on the offer, but he never went all in on his brother's business. You see, uh, the plastic industry was rather cutthroat with small profit margins and significant competition. So Gautam didn't want to build a plastics company. But Gautam did quickly recognize a greater opportunity within the industry. One of the most important materials required for plastic production is PVC. And it seemed to Gautam that all of their PVC suppliers were faring much better than them. So Gautam traveled to South Korea to meet with PVC producers and make an importing deal. And with that, Gautam launched Adani Exports Limited in 1988. Gautam started the company with a total of 500,000 rupees, which at the time was equivalent to about $36,000. Initially, the company imported PVC and sold it to local plastic factories, but it didn't take long for Gautam to expand outside this. Beginning in 1991, the Indian government changed their attitude on business and started passing legislation that was much more favorable to companies. For example, they lightened licensing restrictions, lowered tariffs, and loosened banking policies. This period has since become known as the economic liberalization of India. All these policies led to an influx of capital into the Indian economy and allowed businesses to expand faster than ever before which was perfect timing for Gautam. Gautam went ahead and leveraged these policies to expand the company into trading metals, textiles, and agricultural commodities. A few years later, India opened up the Mandra shipping port to private companies and in 1995, Gautam would win the contract. Since then, the Mandra port has become the largest private port in India. Gautam quickly followed up the success by opening up a power plant in 1996. And by 1998, the Adani Group became India's largest net foreign exchange earner. Despite all this success, Gautam was yet to enter his most successful industry which was the coal industry. The coal industry has historically had a high barrier to entry given the massive costs associated with starting up and the monopolistic nature of the business. 
However, on the flip side, if you are able to dethrone the current co-leader, you'd likely be set for decades. Gautam was well aware of this, so he didn't enter this market until he was truly ready which was until 1999. Soon after, Gautam formed a partnership with a leading Singaporean company called the Wilmer Group. Together, they launched a joint venture called Adani Wilmer, and this cemented Gautam's position within the big leagues. But when you start playing in the big leagues, you start dealing with the big problems. One of the biggest concerns for many billionaires is being assassinated and or being held for ransom. This is why many CEOs and billionaires spend millions if not tens of millions every year on security. They also have many odd practices to reduce the likelihood of being assassinated. Donald Trump, for example, is one of the most flamboyant billionaires out there. You would think that he loves fine dining and fancy restaurants, but more times than not, Trump actually prefers to eat at fast food restaurants. He feels that if he randomly shows up at a fast food restaurant, there's a much smaller likelihood of getting poisoned than if he made a reservation at a fancy restaurant. This is truly quite ironic, but it's part of the price you often have to pay to get to the top. It's not clear how much Gautam paid attention to such threats, but it quickly became clear that he should have paid a lot more attention. In 1998, as Gautam and one of his friends, Santala Patel, exited the Karnavati group, they were stopped at gunpoint by a group of men. They forced the duo to board a van and they took them to an undisclosed location. Fortunately, the group wasn't looking to kill Gautam. They just wanted his money and as soon as he handed over $2 million, they were set free. The kidnapping was eventually linked to two gangsters named Fazil Ul Rechman and Bogalal Darji, both of whom had extensive criminal histories. I'm sure Gautam was a lot more cautious following this incident, but 10 years later, he would find himself in yet another close death encounter. This time though, it wasn't on the streets of India. It was in one of the most luxurious and bougie places in India, the Taj Hotel. On November 26, 2008, the Taj Hotel was one of the targets of a series of terrorist attacks. A group of 10 terrorists invaded the Taj Hotel, killing dozens of people and taking the rest of the hotel as hostage. Unfortunately, Gautam was one of the people at the Taj Hotel when this attack took place, and he says that he witnessed death from a distance of 15 feet. Fortunately, the hotel staff heroically led the surviving victims of the attack to the basement and eventually a chamber hall where they took refuge. They stayed here for the next two and a half days until India's national security guards invaded the Taj and took out the terrorists on November 29, 2008. Evidently, this was the worst experience of Gautam's life, but it did give him a new perspective on life which he has carried with them ever since. So far, we've covered the bright side of Gautam, but many would argue that Gautam also has a dark side. Historically, Gautam has been notorious for leveraging his wealth and power to gain even more wealth and power. For example, you guys may be familiar with the Prime Minister of India, Narendra Modi. Recently, he's become one of the most influential figures in international politics. But Gautam has actually been supporting Modi since 2003. So there's no doubt that Gautam is within the good graces of Modi. And many critics have suggested that Gautam has used this connection to influence national politics and pass beneficial legislation for himself. Aside from strategic lobbying, by far the biggest criticism against Gautam is his environmental impact. Given that he made a lot of his money from coal, his business is naturally going to have a negative environmental impact. But this is not actually what critics are talking about. Critics generally point to instances in which Gautam outrightly defies environmental policies. For example, in 2011, Gautam's company approved an unseaworthy ship carrying coal for a voyage across the ocean. The ship ended up sinking which caused 60,000 metric tons of coal to be deposited into the ocean. Gautam never did anything to clean up the mess and simply paid a $975,000 fine. Similarly, in 2010, his company caused a pollution disaster in Zambia that ended up poisoning the Kafu River. And in 2016, his company started work on their Hazira port without government approval, which made it impossible for local families to fish. On top of his negative environmental impact, many argue that Gautam is having a negative social impact as well. For example, he's accused of working with the police to intimidate people off their land, and he's accused of exploiting workers. Many of his low-level miners and construction workers are paid less than $4 per day. So clearly, Gautam is by no means a saint, but he is trying to turn the tide. While Gautam is by no means shutting down his coal operations, he has done significant good deeds in other sectors. For example, he opened free schools across India which have provided education to 100,000 underprivileged children. Recently, he has also been trying to combat his negative environmental impact. Last summer, Gautam pledged to invest $10 billion into green energy within the next three years. And that's just a fraction of his commitment to invest $70 billion into green energy by 2030. 
This of course doesn't negate all of his damage from the past, but it is nice to see that Gautam is being sensitive to his environmental impact moving forward. In terms of wealth, Gautam reached a peak net worth of $88.5 billion when he overtook Mukesh Ambani. Gautam has since fallen back slightly below Mukesh, but given that Gautam is up $10 billion on the year and Mukesh is down $1 billion on the year, it looks like it's just a matter of time until Gautam decisively overtakes Mukesh. But that's just what I think. Do you guys think Gautam got lucky or do you think he can do it again today without a college degree? Comment that down below. Also, drop a like if you think that people without degrees shouldn't be stigmatized. And consider checking out our international channels to watch our videos in other languages. And consider subscribing to see more questions logically answered. But until then, I'm Hari and I'll see you guys on the next one.